Well, thanks, Bill. I'm not going to be quite as brief in my introduction, um, but I will take a little bit more time because we have a big topic and a fantastic keynote to talk us through the future of Europe this morning. Um, it's no small task that Ambassador O'Sullivan um, has been given to talk about this, this very pressing topic. I don't know if uh, anyone else besides me last night on the Bizabu poll picked European security as the prime issue, but uh, did anyone else pick Europe or is it just me? Yay! <laughs> Mary, you get the first question. <laughs> um, so it's, it's also of crucial importance to the US and the, there have been some very significant challenges to Europe that we've all been watching play out over the last few months and actually the last um, couple years. Um, that are going to affect where Europe is headed and the goal of an ever closer union um, that the EU has stated. Whether it's the refugee crisis that we're seeing play out every day on the on the news and that uh, Assistant Secretary Ann Richard addressed with us last night, whether it's Russia undermining the European security architecture with its invasion of Ukraine, whether it's the Greek debt crisis, um, that was, uh, I never thought so many people would be att paying attention to a debt crisis in Europe over the summer, but there you were. And even the rise of extremism in Europe, perhaps best exemplified, best is probably not the best word there, um, by Prime Minister Viktor Orban of Hungary, who is pursuing something he calls illiberal democracy, which I don't actually think is a thing. Um, but there are also opportunities. We've seen EU unity over maintaining sanctions on Russia. Um, and we have ongoing negotiations for the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, which would bring the US and the EU ever closer. So there are both challenges and there are both opportunities. And we are in very good hands today to learn more um, about the future of Europe with His Excellency Ambassador David O'Sullivan, who is the European ambassador to the United States. Ambassador O'Sullivan took up his post in November of last year at a time of heightened transatlantic activity with the Ukraine crisis, with TTIP negotiations ongoing. And he brings uh, to his post a very, very long career in the EU, 35 plus years. Um, he is one of Ireland's highest ranking officials in the EU. You have his longer bio in the program, so I am not going to go over everything in there because I can't, but we will, I just want to touch on a couple of the, the highlights um, that have served him well uh, to discuss the challenges and opportunities ahead. He was the chief operating officer of the EU's foreign service arm, the external action service, which he actually also helped launch. He served as the secretary general of the European Commission, which is the executive body of the EU, as well as the head of its trade directorate. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador O'Sullivan. Well, thank you very much, Jackie, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be back at the um, World Affairs Council. Uh, we have an excellent uh, collaboration, and I greatly appreciate some of you I've met uh, on my travels around uh, this great country, and we really appreciate the, the network that this offers and, and, and the platform. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful that you've chosen the theme of the, the future of Europe, because I'm glad to think that you feel Europe still has a future, which is <laughs> extremely already already reassuring. Um, the, the, the renowned Danish physicist Niels Bohr used to say, prediction is a very tricky business, especially when it comes to the future. So um, I, I'm, not in, I'm not entirely sure uh, how valid our predictions are going to be uh, in, in the discussion about the future of Europe. But if, if timing is everything in life, I'd want to compliment the World Affairs Council for picking this title. Because this is a week in which we mark several important milestones. On Monday, November 9th, we marked 26 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall, which ended the post-World War II division of Europe. On Tuesday, November 10th, British Prime Minister David Cameron wrote to the European Council President Donald Tusk, setting out requirements for his country's continued membership in a reformed EU ahead of a much anticipated referendum next year. And also on Tuesday, the European Commission released its latest annual report on EU enlargement, covering in particular the Western Balkans and Turkey, areas of great importance strategically. And yesterday, we should not forget, November 11th, it was 97 years since the signing of the armistice that ended the hostilities in World War I, but which unfortunately did not end hostilities uh, in the 20th century in Europe. 
And today is the second and final day of the sixth meeting this year of EU heads of state and government on how to deal with the largest refugee crisis in Europe uh, since 1945, meeting in Valletta and addressing in particular the African dimension of the refugee crisis, which although largely dominated by the debate over Syria, we should not forget the very important uh, African dimension to that problem. So every day this week has had a kind of yin-yang quality, reminding us of the horrors of the past, the challenges of the present, and the need to plan for a better future. And in the next 20 minutes or so, I hope to make clear why I believe that the tendencies that appear today to pull us in opposite directions are actually all part of the dynamic that has existed since the beginning of the European Union, and which, when the chips are down, has always resulted in new adaptations and new forms of cooperation. I do not deny for one moment that in 2015 we are at a pivotal moment. While the European Union with its origins in the rubble of World War II is intended as a guarantee of peace amongst member nations, it is not itself immune from tension. It is natural and even healthy to wonder about breaking and tipping points in a union that has grown from six founding members to 28 today. The debate on EU membership just getting underway in the United Kingdom is important in this respect and should frankly be welcomed. We cannot take for granted the European project, which in its short life, just over 60 years, has reunited Europe, provided unprecedented peace and prosperity to 500 million citizens, created the largest market in history and the largest economy in the world, and now acts a beacon, as, a, as a beacon of hope in our region and the world. But this process has provoked opposition. And I think we cannot run away from a genuine democratic debate about what direction we want to take Europe in and whether the direction of greater integration is better than a reversion to some form of, of enhanced nationalism. This is a legitimate discussion and I think we should welcome it and, and embrace it. So these are tempestuous times for and within the European Union. A financial crisis has given way to an economic crisis, followed by unsettling developments in our East, as was already referred to, Russian activity in Ukraine, and an unprecedented refugee crisis primarily from the South. We seem to be getting it from all sides. But, as Shakespeare said, if the past is prologue, we have good reason to be confident that the European Union can grow from its present difficulties. Crisis and change are part of the DNA of the European Union. From experience, we know that our journey from the 1950s to the present has not unfolded neatly, but we also know that we've always managed to move forward, often after setbacks, while dealing with the big and serious questions of our time. Take enlargement, arguably the greatest proof of the success of the EU model. The EU has gone through seven separate expansions, the first of which uh, took place uh, after the immediate failure to establish a European defence community in 1954. And people sometimes forget that the, the first project of European integration was actually an integrated defence community. Each enlargement has been different and important, happening against a unique set of circumstances. The creation of the European Economic Community of Six Nations in 1957, which was the response to the failure of the defence community, was essentially about the reconciliation of France and Germany uh, after the Second World War. The next enlargement in 1973, which brought in the United Kingdom, Denmark and Ireland, and while I don't underestimate the importance of Irish accession to the European Union, nor that of my Danish colleagues, I think the key there was in fact bringing the United Kingdom into the project. We should not forget that when Winston Churchill extolled the, version, the, the virtues of the United States of Europe uh, in his famous speech in 1948, he very clearly saw the United Kingdom as outside of that United States of Europe. So bringing the UK into uh, the European Economic Community in 1973 was a very, very important political statement. The next two enlargements in 1981 and 1986 brought Greece, Spain and Portugal supporting their tender democracies after periods of military rule. My former boss, Commission President Jose Manuel Barroso, often reminded audiences that he spent the first 18 years of his life in a dictatorship in Portugal. It is an extraordinary life story which went on to see him become Prime Minister in a democratic Portugal and President of the European Commission in a democratic European Union. The next enlargement, which brought the EU to 15 with Austria, Finland and Sweden, did not happen until 1995 in the midst of an extremely dynamic decade. We were completing the vast single market in 1992, preparing the countries of Central and Eastern Europe for EU membership, laying the groundwork for economic and monetary union and the euro, while revisiting the thorny issue, thorny issue of a common European foreign policy to equip the EU for a new post-Cold War context. 
The Schengen area is also a product of this time. Schengen ushered in open borders and free circulation of people and goods that our founders only dreamed of, and which until now we have begun to take for granted. Schengen, like the Euro, is an important symbol of European integration. Today it is coming under pressure because of the refugee crisis, but it absolutely must be maintained. The fifth largest and most historic enlargement happened in 2004, when eight countries that were once behind the Iron Curtain joined along with Cyprus and Malta. Bulgaria and Romania joined in a sixth expansion in 2007, bringing in the last of the European countries once under Soviet control. I do not believe that the European Union can take great credit for the collapse of the Berlin Wall. I do believe that the European Union can take enormous credit for, what, for the fact that what followed was not chaos uh, and violence, but rather an orderly progression from former dictatorships to democratic, market-based economies espousing uh, European and universal human rights. And I think that is a, a remarkable achievement. Finally, in 2013, Croatia became the first of the Balkan countries to join, an important milestone in recovery from the Balkan Wars of the 1990s and opening a new chapter in Europe's reconciliation with its past. So, when has it ever been easy in Europe? Starting with its own origin, the history of the European Union, much of which my own career has tracked, and I thank Jackie for keeping it brief when people describe my bio in, in these events, I feel like the whole of my life is passing in front of my eyes, and, <laughs> and I'm certainly not getting any younger in the process. Um, but it has been, the history of the European Union has been punctuated with moments of deep crisis that have ultimately resolved in a way that made us stronger. I've already mentioned the first failure in 1954 to create a European defense community, but that ultimately gave rise to the European Economic Community, which gradually transformed Europe economically and cemented its pivotal role in stabilizing post-1989 Europe. The implicit political nature of that role meant that security and foreign policy cooperation were back on the table and eventually were dealt with in the treaties of Maastricht in 1992 and Lisbon in 2007. So after decades, decades after the original attempt, we have today the common security and defense policy to help meet our security objectives. While there is still no European army, there are some 7,000 men and women, both civilian and military, serving in 17 common security and defense policy missions deployed in three continents, mostly on the peacekeeping, capacity building, and training end of the spectrum. This is something which I think is not generally recognized. In 1965, the empty chair crisis erupted when France, under General Charles de Gaulle, boycotted meetings of the Council over differences about the roles and powers of the European institutions. It was, in its own way, a kind of earthquake. And I, talking to many French officials who were around at the time, many of them were packing their bags and thinking the experiment was all over and it had failed. Words which I've heard many times since. My own career in the European Union began in 1979, dealing during the gloomy period of Eurosclerosis a term coined by a German economist to describe Europe's stalled economic growth, high unemployment and inflation, and a slowing pace of European integration. And to be fair, the international economy was also reeling from the oil shocks of the 70s. Eurosclerosis seemed endless until in 1986, Europe got its groove back under the leadership of Jacques Delors, a French socialist, who set in motion the process that led to the landmark Single European Act of 1986, and set December 31st, 1992 as the deadline to realize Europe's founding ambition, a single market, which has since grown to be the world's largest economy. The 1990s began when the EU was thrust into an unfamiliar spotlight. The Berlin Wall had fallen, the Soviet Union was no more, and the big challenge was to stabilize the new democracies and prepare them for eventual membership. At the same time as Europe worked with all the new democracies on a pre-accession strategy, it was also taking concrete steps to introduce a new currency in 2002. Allow me to take a moment to respond to some of the revisionism that you hear these days about whether enlargement was the right step forward or whether the euro was the right step forward. In my view, this is a tired, and wide, a tired debate in the widening versus deepening uh, ish, issue of the European Union, which basically presents a false choice. In my view, Europe can and must do both. And we have done it with the expansion to Central and Eastern Europe and the Balkans and with the launch of the Euro. These are two of our greatest accomplishments as a union and we should be proud of them. All EU enlargements are challenging, but we have an investment in peace, security and stability. They have enriched new and old member states alike by opening up new opportunities for people, companies, investors, and they have been very real gains in trade, jobs, investment and GDP. 
and even the prospect of membership has a powerful transformative effect, embedding positive democratic, economic, political, and social change. You have only to look at the separate paths taken by Poland and Ukraine uh, since 1990 to understand what is the difference between being part of the European Union and choosing an alternative vision. Regarding the euro, if I had one for every time I've been told it was a mistake, I'd be a very rich man. <laughs> But I do take quite some satisfaction in knowing that some who made a fortune betting against the euro also lost it by underestimating the extent of our commitment to maintaining the common currency. I say here and I say everywhere I go, and I believe it profoundly, and I'm an economist by training, the euro has been a success. In everyday sense of just making it easier and cheaper for companies and consumers to do business and travel across border, but in the larger sense of being a global currency directly used or indirectly in 60 countries and the world's second reserve currency. I think it also acted as a shock absorber when the financial crisis struck. I've never had seen an economic study of what would have happened if we still had 18 separate currencies during the financial crisis of 2008. The reason we brought in the euro was during the two oil shocks of the 70s, European currencies went off like fireworks in all directions, with massive competitive de devaluation. Devaluation is perhaps a useful tool of economic policy, but it only works if nobody else does it. If everyone devalues, then frankly you're back to where you started. And when you consider that 95% of economic activity in the European Union is between ourselves, it is undisputably the case that we're better off having a common currency rather than experiencing the exchange rate risks. Of course we know there were some flaws in the design of monetary union. We know that member states didn't necessarily act in their fiscal and budgetary policy as though they were part of a single currency, and we've had to correct those flaws. And I believe that we have done that very successfully. So the shortcomings in the original design have complicated our ability to respond, uh, but we galvanized ourselves to put in place far-reaching reforms, which I believe now mean that we would not face such a crisis again. We still have a lot of work to do, but we put in place a banking union. We're now looking at the possibility of capital markets union, uh, and uh, I believe that uh, we are slowly uh, rebuilding the situation in Europe, uh, even if there are still problems in a number of our member states. But there is no longer the existential risk to the euro, and recovery in the euro is uh, well underway. If you're picking up a subtext here, let me say it more explicitly. The process of European integration has always had a slightly exasperating quality, rather like the dance of Ectonaut. Three steps forward, two steps back. Sometimes three steps back, uh, sometimes four steps back, but then, then four steps forward again. And it's easy to understand why this is the case, because what we are doing is unique in the history of the world, which is the pooling of sovereignty between 28, as we now are, democratic, sovereign nation states. And we are transferring the sovereignty of member states to the EU's governing institutions in order to be able to produce and implement coherent and effective policies in area of EU competence or where EU action is needed. Now the reality is that very often this process is done partially because the natural reaction of these 28 sovereign states is to say, well, yeah, I, I'll give a certain amount of sovereignty to the European level, but I want to keep the maximum to me. And then you discover when that, if you like, comes under stress, that actually you needed to do more Europe. And that's been the experience with the single market. That's been the experience with the euro. And I believe that will now be the experience with the refugee crisis. Because at the end of the day, we will discover that member states are not able to implement fully the responsibilities that they wished to retain and that they will need European assistance uh, and more European intervention to help them do that. The, the refugee crisis, of course, has been uh, a major challenge, and I think we need to dig in for the long haul, because this is not going to go away quickly. And I think we need to understand that this is something that we're going to have to address literally in terms of decades going forward. And since that crisis began to unfold in January, we've been working flat out to come up with more immediate and dealing essentially with the immediate problems, but we also will have to deal with the long-term problems. It's extremely difficult politically, for all the reasons that you know, also because some of the frontline countries like Greece and Italy are also those struggling economically, and it's not easy to combine these two things. But also there are a number of countries who are experiencing having to deal with migration, which is not something they've had to deal with in their recent history. 
It's also not black and white, because on the one hand, you have real people in real distress. And I think we cannot help but be moved by the plight of the many people uh, leaving a uh, disaster in, in the Middle East or in Africa, walking to Europe with their families, carrying children on their backs. You cannot, you'd have to be a stone not to, not to shed a tear when you see what is happening. But we also know that uh, there is a counter problem, which is the uh, sustainability of large-scale immigration, whether in the form of refugees or asylum seek seekers, uh, in, in, our in our own societies, and how that is going to be managed. Mistakes have certainly been made, tempers have flared, and frankly some things have been said which would have been better left unsaid. But that's politics. And if I may, I think if you had had to face a similar debate in the United States, you might have made some of the same mistakes. But perhaps that's not for an ambassador to say. <laughs> So we are helping in, our, in the best way we can, both in terms of how we receive and look after the asylum seekers. Uh, we are the largest donor of humanitarian assistance to the other countries uh, near Syria who are highly affected, Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon. By the way, the United States is also a major contributor, but we would like some other people to step up and give more to the uh, agencies. We have had uh, search and rescue operations, which certainly around 3,000 people have died crossing the Mediterranean, but we should not forget that uh, over 125,000 have actually been rescued. I'm not saying that we've done enough, and I'm not saying that we can be complacent, and I'm not saying that uh, we, we do not need to do more to address this, but uh, I think this is another area where we are going to discover, once again, that the transfer of sovereignty to the European uh, level was not quite sufficient, and I'm sure that's going to see, see itself corrected uh, in, in the coming months. And we should not forget that what we're experiencing in Europe is only one manifestation of a global crisis of 60 million displaced people around the world. And many of other countries of the world, I mentioned three, but I could talk about Kenya or other countries in Africa, are having to deal with far, far larger numbers uh, of refugees and, and, and asylum seekers than we're having to deal with in Europe. I've just completed one year as the EU ambassador to the United States, and it's been a fascinating moment. Uh, I've enjoyed enormously being in this great country, the cooperation with the administration and Congress have helped me to see that in Washington, the EU, probably uh, because of our long history of crisis management, is seen as a, a, a multifaceted actor uh, in dealing with today's complex security challenges. Of course, uh, everyone in Washington still thinks of Europe as composed also of individual member states. I get that. I have 28 wonderful ambassador colleagues from each of the, uh, the member states, uh, and they're uh, busy pursuing uh, their national objectives, but they are extremely supportive of what we do as the, as the EU. And I do think that in terms of security and foreign policy, where we are now with the US administration is, you know, light years uh, ahead of where we were 10 years ago. That is not to say that Europe is yet uh, a fully fledged uh, security actor for all the reasons that we know, but I believe we are increasingly engaged, whether it is uh, reacting to Russia's uh, behavior in Crimea uh, or the separatist movements in the east of the country, what we were able to do together on Iran, where it was European sanctions, which undoubtedly played a major role in bringing Iran back to the table, and also those talks were chaired uh, by the European Union in the form of uh, Vice President, Vice Representative Mogherini, uh, and we will be charged actually with the implementation of the, uh, the Iran agreement. So what I'd like to say by way of conclusion is that for the, first, for the second half of the 20th century, the process of European integration was necessarily rather Eurocentric. We were recovering from the ravages of war, we were recovering from all the isms that led to our destruction by putting our energy and creativity into a deliberate effort to make another war impossible. The European Union, for all its squabbles and shortcomings, has lived up to this founding ambition, a fact that was recognized with the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012. But I do believe that the narrative of European integration in the 21st century will have to change from being inwardly focused to being more about Europe's role in the world. I quoted President Barroso once, I'll quote him a second time. He loved to say, in the 21st century, scale will count. A, a European Union of 500 million consumers, uh, the largest economy in the world, speaking with one voice on the international stage, can have influence. Not even the largest of our member states 
alone can aspire to have anything like the same influence. And yet the big challenge we will face, both for Europe and for the United States, is how to make sure that in the 21st century, it is the common values that we share of democracy, human rights, market economy, free individual freedom, and poss possibility for people to shape their own destinies will prevail, or whether other philosophies coming from other parts of the world will prevail. And that is ultimately something in which I believe we are closely engaged together with the United States, uh, and I'm absolutely certain that the European Union will continue uh, to progress, grow, and thrive in the way that it has in the last century. Thank you very much indeed.